What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of University of Adversity. I'm your host, Lance Isios. My next guest is a five-time best-selling author who is obsessed with entrepreneurs, their backstories, words, and of course, coffee. <laughs> she helps entrepreneurs write, publish, and launch their books so they can grow their brand, expand their impact, increase influence, and leave a legacy for their lives. So I'm so excited. We've been wanting to connect for a while, and I'm just so pumped up to dive into her story. So Elizabeth Lyons, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Lance, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. And yeah, that intro, I love it because I was reading it and I'm like, this is great. <laughs> I get pumped up for the intros. It's like right? one of my favorite parts. It's like, I treat it like I'm uh, in, a, in a, like a sports game or something, you know, and I like to just pump For sure. Up. I like to pretend I'm the athlete because that is definitely not a reality that I experience. <laughs> yeah, I find that energy. I love like you can see the person get excited and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's totally adds to the conversation. So Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So, okay, you've, you work with people getting their message out there. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to dive into that, but maybe just take us back. I'll uh, just give us a bit of a backstory, mm -hmm. where you're from, all that fun stuff and, you know, how you became, oh, you know, where you're at now. Okay, so like literally where I'm from is Delaware, the state of Delaware, out on the East Coast, below Pennsylvania, in case people are like, where is that? Um, let me turn this off. I am, let's see, I got here in a really roundabout way, if I'm being completely transparent. Um, I've been a writer my entire life. I've always loved writing. I've always loved words. I've always been sort of fascinated slash obsessed with words, almost in a way that uh, I guess normal people didn't find completely normal. So for a while I questioned whether or not that was normal. And it wasn't really my full on career path until about three years ago. So I published my first book in 2003 and I was doing some other things at that time professionally. And around three, two to three years ago is when I decided to really make the leap and make this my full time, my full time thing. So what is it like, how did you get into writing? Like, why, why do you, why are you obsessed with it so much? Maybe, you know, because there's so much value in words and, you know, I, I, I'm learning it more and more and more, you know, especially in, you know, when you start getting into like ad copy and yeah, the trying whole thing. to explain your story, there's so yeah. much power. So, you know, yeah. how did you get involved in that? And, you know, you know, what made you so interested in that? I don't know. I mean, I've always been a reader and I've always written, you know, stuff. Um, I wrote, started to write my first book when I was six. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I just sat down at the kitchen table with a pencil, like a number two pencil and lined paper. And I started at chapter six because chapter one, that was too, that was too hard and overwhelming to start. So I tried, you know, and I wrote for like 20 minutes and then I recognized, oh man, I can't write a whole book in one sitting. So I quit and I went outside and I did something else. And when I was in high school, I was part of the journalism club and I really, really wanted to study journalism in college. That was my, that was my plan. I don't know if it was so much because of the words. I just know that all my life, when I, when I come upon uh, two or more words or even one in some cases, but that are put together, that just, there's no better way to express a feeling it, it's, I don't know. It's just, it, it's fascinating to me and to a lot of other people, they think I'm completely insane, but I'm so glad to have finally found a way to make that work. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You almost have to have people think you're insane a little bit. I guess, you know, like but people say, like I, my big thing is words matter. Right. So when someone says to me, it's semantics, I'm like, exactly, exactly. Because you know, whether your communication is quite fascinating to me as well, um, perhaps coincidentally, perhaps ironically, but, you know, the way that we express and communicate our thoughts and our feelings and whether it's personal, well, it's always personal, but it, you know, whether it's professional or intimate relationships or we're telling our story or whatever it is, I'm just, words are what make us be able to do that. Without words, how do we how do we do that? So, yeah. And do you find it challenging as far as, see, I, this is, this is speaking for me personally. 
you have this idea, but you can't, you can't articulate it onto paper or yes. onto a post and you want to yeah. be able to pull that out, but it almost feels like it's not matching. Do you, do you yeah. have that? And, and how, all the time. how do you get past that? You stop thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not. So lots of times when I work with clients, we, they'll say, well, I've been trying to write about this for so long. And I sit down at my desk and I start writing and I'm just stuck. Like, I just don't even know what to do. And so I say, oh, and I just start a casual conversation, just like you and I are having right now. And because they've taken the pressure off of themselves to come up with the, the perfect first word or the perfect way of saying something, we're just having a conversation. There's no pressure. They'll say something that I'm like, that's that, that right there. That's it. And that's a beautiful moment in a conversation. You know, that's a beautiful moment in the process of it. Sometimes you just... You're trying too hard to find the words. Yeah, that's, that's gold. And that's, that's kind of, like, that's like this conversation too, or podcasts, just that comfortable mm -hmm. conversation you can have with somebody and two humans having a conversation. Yeah. You can pull so much gold out that you don't even realize is happening, you know? Correct. And, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure when you work with people that you find stuff get stuff out of them that they didn't even realize that all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. All the time, all the time, all the time. And so what's interesting, Lance, is that when we're writing books, when we go in and I tell people this, you know, there, there are some things that people have to be prepared for when they're writing a book, even if they're just writing entrepreneurial stuff. And Mike Young is a great example, right? So we were working on his book. His just came out made over like a month ago. And when we were working on his book, initially he was very focused on like the nuts and bolts of it, as I would say. I mean, Mike's just, you know, Mike, he's like, do this, do this. I believe this. This is how it works. Boom, boom, boom. But as we continued to have these conversations, all of a sudden he was like, wow, I didn't even realize that when I was 15, you know, this thing that happened affected the way that I would later run my business. And so... I've gotten to the point where I kind of not warn people. I don't want to say I warn anybody, but like I'm clear about letting them know this is going to be fun. It's going to be a process, but it's not going to be as simple as put these 10 bullet points down on a piece of paper and we're done because people do realize things that they didn't realize before. So you must like so many people think writing a book, you have to have accomplished some amazing things, but I, do you feel that, like that, that's just me coming into it. I'm thinking I'm, I have to do this and I have to, you know, all these kind of things. And that's my own limited beliefs. Do you find a lot of people that really doubt their story? Like they Everybody actually think does. that, Oh, I'm not one of them. I'm not Everybody one of those does. people that can write a book. Yep. Right. Everybody, Everybody goes through that. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody thinks, who am I to write this? Why is anyone going to want to read this? Why is anyone going to care? Who am I, you know, who am I in the sense of, I'm not really anybody, right? I'm not Oprah, I'm not Jim Carrey. I'm not, a, yeah, I, I don't have any accolades. Like, why does it matter? Everybody goes through that. And my thing is, your accolade is that you lived. Like, you can't be older than maybe 15, if that, and not have some series of lessons and perspective from which you can impact other people. Yeah, because everybody's story matters, you know? It, yeah. Like, it, it's crazy because, you know, there's so many people walking around that have all this, this gold to give, but they don't realize it in themselves. Yep. They don't have oh, the luck for the themselves. Truth. Well, that's the truth because I think that to some degree, right, we're conditioned, whether it's, we could argue, not argue, we could discuss this all day, whether it's through social media or regular media or TV show, whatever it is, we've become conditioned that, like, you don't have a story unless everyone knows who you are. You don't have a story unless the masses are glomming on and wanting to know, ooh, is that ring an engagement ring? You know, if you, if you go trend toward, like, the gossip section or the whatever, it's so, if people think back to the last time they learned something really profound, it was probably from like somebody at the grocery store or something, or it was like a bumper sticker they saw. It's, that's when the magic hits. 
And it's through other people's stories that we identify and the emotion that other people's stories stir up in us is exactly what allows us to receive the lesson. Oh, that is, that is just gold. It's you know, so true. So, uh -huh. The storytelling is so powerful. <laughs> and if you could tell a story, I'm learning this more and more. I never realized it. Mm -hmm. But that's what, that's what, that's what connects us to people. All a hundred percent. You know, the, the, yeah. you know, the journey and, and that human connection, like, oh, I'm just like him. You're just like me. That's it. That's it. We're all very, we're unique, but we're not that different. And that's why there will be some little piece of your story. You know, I can think of different people I've talked to over the last year who are wildly different in life experience than me. They've spent time in prison. They've spent time addicted to substances. They've spent time homeless, like all kinds of things that I, at, at the top uppermost level, like the big thing I can't relate to. I don't understand what that feels like, but then they'll tell me one tiny thing. It, it could be as simple as that they, we like the same TV show or we both like this character or we both read this book or I don't know. And all of a sudden there it is, there it is. And now the rest of it is just peripheral. And now I'm going, okay, now that I feel that minor connection with you, I want to know the rest of your story because now I, I see that's the entry point. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you nailed it because I, okay. I, I know exactly what you're talking about because that's how, that's how it, it works for me as well. So for an example, when I was working in bars at restaurants, mm -hmm. okay, I had a lot of high level people coming in, you know, the nose up in the air yeah. and I'd be like, look, I'm going to crack this person. I know that they're going to, I'm, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be my best friend by the time mm -hmm. they leave. At first you can feel the resistance and yes. then you find that one thing and you're that's like, it. See them, you see them connect. Like you literally connect with them. Yes. And then it's like, everything just opens up. Yeah. And it's so true because that there's that thing that you just need to have that common interest or that common, that connection that could just open so many doors. And certain people I think can realize that some certain people mm -hmm. don't, I, I'm not sure if that's, yeah. anybody goes through that or not. I don't know. I, I'll make a bold statement. I've not said this publicly before, but I will go out on a long limb and say that if everybody in the world were willing to listen to the story of everyone else in the world, we wouldn't have any issues. Okay, because the thing is, to, your, to use your experience with working in the bars and the restaurants, when people come in, they're coming in with their perception. So you have your perception of them, nose in the air, suit, making a lot of money, whatever the case may be. They have their perception of you working behind the bar and all the things that come with that. Yeah. But the minute that you can say, I mean, why were you working at the bar? Like, what were you, the minute you can say, yeah, I'm working toward this. I want to own this business. I want to do, I want to have this impact. And the minute that they can say, I grew up in poverty. Now, all of a sudden, your view, your focus is shifted and you get to a place of empathy. And from there, it, it all, it, you, you're no longer reacting. Yeah, for sure. And that is the one thing that I, you know, I've been out of the bars for a while now, but like, even <laughs> when, like, thank God I'm out of the bars. Now. There, there was, there was a lot of, look, there was a lot of fun times and I Talk love the people. stories, man. I got, I had so many stories, but yeah. like, the human connection, I, I try to really break it down. Like, what did I like about this? Why yeah. do I like the bars? Mm -hmm. uh, beside the fact that I could, you know, drink and hang out with people, I just like the human connection, right? Yeah. And I wanted, I figured out what was it that, that, that brought me mm -hmm. to that. So now that I'm, you know, in business and, you know, with sales and, and networking, it's the same thing. It's that same thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll get on calls with people and, you know, you can feel that, that sort of um, rigidness. And then as soon as you find out, it's, it's qualifying the human, really. And you find that common yeah, interest. Right. And then you're like, okay, you're just like me. Just like correct. a post, just like we were saying. Correct. You're just like me and I'm just like you. So now we can talk and share That's stories. Correct. Right? It's, it's fascinating. It's and fascinating. I, love, I love that you, you brought that up and we started to go down that. Because, you know, it's, it's amazing. So, um, okay. 
I want to discuss a little bit on some of the stuff over the years, you know, being an entrepreneur, being an author. Let's talk about some deep stuff that you've had to overcome because, you know, you're doing some amazing things right now and helping a lot of people. And I just want to know, you know, for somebody out there who may be on the same journey as you are, you know, what are, what are some of the hard things that you've had to go through that you've had to overcome to become where you are now? Well, there's a lot. What's the th lot. something that sticks and, out to you? You know, I am for all intents and purposes, the only entrepreneur in my family. So I have a phenomenal family of origin. They are what I would consider to be slightly risk averse. Um, so I have one sister and then my parents and all three of them are, are, they're very smart and they're creative and they're fun and, 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 and things are safe and things that aren't safe are scary and we don't do that. Mm. So for me to even go out onto this entrepreneurial it's not something I saw growing up. It's not certainly not something I was taught. Um, I launched into it at a time when it wasn't, you know, now it's kind of trendy to do, which bring, which is good and bad. It, it brings about pros and cons, but all of the limiting beliefs that I had to work through and the, the, the roller coaster that is being an entrepreneur, which in my opinion, is true even if you work for a corporation, sometimes even more so. I feel like I have actually more control at this point over my life as an entrepreneur than I would if I were receiving a paycheck every two weeks. That's just me. But there were a lot of um, things that happened from deciding what my business model was gonna be, what was I gonna focus on? Um, I have five kids. So, and I'm a, wow. well, I'm not a single mom. I'm very clear about this. So my kid's dad and I are no longer married. We're very good friends. He lives three blocks away. I never claim the single mom card because he's incredibly involved financially, emotionally, in every way possible. So I don't, I've never felt like a single mom, but I'm extremely independent. So I want to provide for my kids when they're with me, for my house, for my own car, my dog, et cetera, all on my own. That's been my deal ever since we made this decision to do things slightly differently. And that can be really scary when you have a lot of people on the outside, specifically your, your family going, what are you, what are you doing? Right? What, what are you thinking? This is not responsible. So I wrote about that a ton, shame with self-promotion, but my last book enough, that's pretty much what it was about. Well, I love the shameless promote. Plugs. That's awesome. That's, <laughs> we're all about that. We're here to, I love it. You throw that sound well, light in, right? Don't worry. We're going to be plugging you. You deserve it. And I love it. You're you know, great. talk about your work. It's amazing. And you know, yeah, no, that's for sure. And sometimes just that word entrepreneur, people are like, why don't you get a real job? Like, you know, that yeah. like, like, what it's really, it's really hard. I mean, I, I talked to, and, and granted, this is predominantly women, but I don't want to suggest that it's always women. This is just my experience. But, you know, they've been at home raising kids for a large number of years, and they want to try something new on the side, and they're not getting great support from their partner because it's not a real job, right? But by that argument, being a mother isn't a real job either because the last, I, I don't, never got a paycheck for that. So. <laughs> Yeah. The, Not an the, official one anyway. The real, yeah. The hardest job is being a mother. Like, I mean, come on, if you can raise yeah. five kids, that's, you've won, you've won already. Thanks. Like, that's, I don't know. We'll see. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> like I, you know, just learning how to take care of myself. I mean, I, I'm 35. Right. I don't sometimes, have kids yet. Listen, sometimes I have trouble with that as well. So, you know, and that's the thing, the real job, like tell me what a real yeah. job is, you know, like, what is it? Yeah. Something that you hate, you suffer and we're so conditioned to think you have to suffer and you have to hate your life and you got to do all these, put in all these hours. And then that's a real job. It's such a twisted. No, I know it's very twisted. Up. It's so funny that you would say that. I was just talking about this to someone the other day. And I said, what's so unfortunate is that we've come to believe, you know, what we can actually not only make the most money doing it. And I'm not suggesting that it's all about that because it's not for me, but what we can make the most money doing and be the most, uh, financially comfortable doing and also be the most happy, the most financially rewarding in our soul doing is the thing that actually comes pretty easily to us. 
but we've been conditioned to believe that that's not true. That in order to make a lot of money or in order to be you know, super successful and super happy, you've got to just be grinding it out and hating it. And you know, he who will or she who will grind it out the hardest, hustle the hardest, um, and have the least happy and satisfying personal life, they win, they win. And that's just wrong, completely wrong. Yeah, totally. And I'm realizing that more and more mm -hmm. because that energy, you know, I've, I've gotten into the personal development world, that energy, the, all the stuff. And I find life flows, you know, the more I'm not beating myself up about stuff. The more I beat correct. myself up, the less things flow. And that's you're right. Correct. You nailed it. Things, things shouldn't be always complicated and hard. Otherwise, maybe you're not doing what you're meant to be doing, right? Yeah, something's not. I mean, there's no taking away from the fact that there are going to be hiccups. Of course. I don't care what you do, right? If you make $500 million a year, they're just going to be really expensive hiccups. They're going to be really expensive decisions you have to make that come with more stress and higher paid attorneys and therapists and who knows what, right? But the, our focus has to shift to where, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that you can go back to anyone's childhood and find what they innately got lost in as a child. And, if you, and you can connect that to what they will, their zone of genius as an adult. Yeah, I love that you said that um, because, but then you know what's crazy is that when you go back, I, you know, when you go back to your childhood and mm. it seems like there was like this trauma, it was actually like a gift, oh. you know, like hundred percent. I'm like, I look at mine and I'm like, for the longest time, you know, the self pity, like, why did that happen? And I'm like, wait yes. a minute, if that didn't happen, yes. then how would I have ever grown? Right. But this is where the story becomes so important because the other thing that people do is they think, well, my story isn't as good because it's not as traumatic. Okay. This, this happens. So I have a client in the UK who by her own admission was raised in an incredibly privileged environment and that caused some problems too. So it's not about, not problems, but some challenges when she got out on her own. I mean, it's, it's all about owning where you came from and what experiences you've ha you have had and not, not feeling a need to compare those to other people and say, I mean, yes, it's wonderful to be able to say, look, I'm so grateful today that this is my greatest challenge because I know there are people dealing with, with worse. But you can still learn something from that challenge and you can still impact other people for having gone through that challenge. Period. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's funny because... It's funny that we're talking about that because I always said like with my, my past, I was like, I could write a book on this. It's so crazy. My, my childhood. And, and that was one thing I was always like, you know, one day, you know, <laughs> but yeah. I, it, it's crazy because so many people have that, that the, the craziness in their life, but they don't uh -huh. value it enough. And, um, I want to, <gasps> I wanted to dive into another thing that you just mentioned. Um, so I had the amazing Rob Mack from good morning, La La Land on. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, yep. Um, we talked about, we talked about happiness and, you know, he's so good at, he, you know, happiness coach. And he was talking about yeah. how working with, you know, high profile people, su su successful people, celebrities, they all have, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. They have everything mm -hmm. and they're still not fully fulfilled. They're still not happy. Right. And, and they said that they were happier when they were broke. Yeah, and in many cases, yeah. This was this was gold, you guys. So if you're listening to this, go back and listen to this episode because it really like it it, it goes into this. And I just love how it really just breaks down to the human, like you know, the happiness factor and what makes you happy. It's not going to be the external things all the time. Of no. course, it's fun to have to have a car and all that. That's sure. Stuff but like, what is happening inside? What is happening inside? And and why do you have the outside stuff? And so often, like, especially when I work with entrepreneurs who are now at a really high level of what they're doing, they are in, in the beginning, they're afraid to tell where they've been because they feel like it somehow weakens their positioning. And I'm like, I, I, I'm like out of my chair when that happens because it only strengthens your positioning. If you've had it beautifully since day one, I can't relate to you. 
Yeah. So I want to know what you've gone through. Oh, I love that because so many people are so scared to tell their story. You yeah. know, my whole life, well, it was about, it was like, don't, don't tell anybody anything. Don't say anything about this. Don't do anything because it look, makes you look like you're weak. Right. My dad, yeah. that's how he was conditioned. So it was yeah. like, don't say anything. So, you know, once I started sharing stories and, 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 you know, getting into a community that people like start sharing, it's like, it mm-hmm. gives you this power. Yeah. It makes you, it, it lets you, it allows you to sort of just like, Ooh, I've, I've, I've let this out and it feels good. And, yeah. and it's so good that you brought that up because so many people are just so worried that they're going to be judged on their story or that, um, oh, I shouldn't talk about that, or I'm going to disappoint my, my aunt or my uncle or my, yep. you know, and, and maybe just, can you just maybe talk about how you, how you can talk to somebody to really make that shift that it's more of yeah. coming from an empowerment instead of, you know, disempowering? Well, so you just said it, right? It's about, it's about being vulnerable in a powerful way as opposed to being vulnerable in a victim way. So sometimes what we see is people who have made it really big in in some capacity, and they're quite successful by societal definition, they weren't quite ready to get there. Like their mindset didn't grow as quickly as their notoriety. And so they're still reliant upon their followers and the public to make them feel like they're valuable. So they tell you about their past in such a way that whether they realize it or not, they're trying to elicit you saying, it's okay, you're amazing. Oh my gosh, it's amazing how far you've come, things like that. That's not what I teach. So it's not, it's about here's where I've been and I'm owning that. And it's not about where I've been, it's about how I got where I am. So it's, it's the lessons that I've learned along the way that got me to here that I want to share. The point isn't I went through this. The point, the, what the point is, is in order to get through that, I did this. That's what people want to know because right. they want to be able to apply that to their own life. Right. What do you see when you're working with these entrepreneurs? What do you see is the, mo- the biggest hiccup? Is it, is that, is it the, getting the story out or is it, limited beliefs, you know, what is, what is it like a usually, I know there's not always going to be one thing it's going to be a few, but you know, what is, what is the thing that sort of like makes them kind of hold back? Like what it's on their growth. Yeah. So one of them is the, I don't have time to write a book, which I totally get, but in, I would say 90% of cases you can translate that. And what they're, what they're really saying is I'm afraid to write the book because writing a book isn't, I'm not a writer. Writing a book isn't in my lane and I'm somehow going to screw up my brand. So therefore I don't have time to do it. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes out underneath that, that we spend a good bit of time working through, which is always, it's my favorite part of the whole thing. I'm not a licensed therapist. I'm licensed through Google. However, I'm pretty sure, but you know, it's like you, I'm not, I don't care if someone can write. I don't care if someone likes to write. I just want them to tell me their story. Yeah. That's it. So there's lots of entrepreneurs that listen to this. When is, when is the right time to write a book? Mm-hmm. You know, when is the right time? When is that um, like, Hey, okay, let's do this. So the key with the right time, I'm a fan of air quotes. Have you noticed? Yeah. I love air quotes too. Okay. I'm a little, it's a little much, <laughs> but I talk a lot with my hands. So I'm either doing this or I'm doing this. Um, <laughs> it's not so much about the right time as it is about knowing why you're doing it. So if you're writing a book because you're thinking, I can become a bestseller, again, here come the air quotes, I can become a bestseller and that in and of itself is going to launch my career and put me in front of millions of eyes and bring in millions of dollars, you're going to be disappointed, plain and simple. If the intention is, let's put it this way, my, I work with people whose intention is to, they want to tell their story. They want to share, right? They want to, they're willing and comfortable to be powerfully vulnerable with their audience. They also want to, for many of them, they're coaches and they do one-on-one coaching and they're coaching their high ticket packages. And lots of times, I mean, there are a lot of people in the world, that's not an option for them. A book is a way to impact more people 
because they can read the book and you can give them exercises and strategies and things that they can implement without having to hire you one-on-one -on -one or in a group session or a group um, environment. So that's another reason. Um, it's, it's, it's all about your intention and what your intention is. I mean, we hear it all the time now, like it's, a, it's the best calling card you can have. That's sometimes true. If, if I meet someone somewhere and they've written a book and I get a hold of their book and I'm, I'm loving what's in it, and I feel connected to them, maybe I'm going to reach out and, and recommend someone to them or join their program or something like that. But if someone's written a book just to, see the air quotes, write a book, and it's really more of a pamphlet than a book and it's not well written and it's just kind of thrown together, in my world that speaks to the overall, their overall brand. And so I, as a consumer, go, well, if this is the amount of effort that you're putting into your book, and yet you're running a $5,000 program, if I'm going to give you $5,000, are you going to put the same amount? You, you want all of this to be consistent. So right. Congruency, yeah, all congruency across the board. And context. I mean, it's just, it's everything. Yeah, you know, because, man, writing a book was, is something that so many people think about. They just, you know, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that... Well, I can only speak for myself, but it's something that I've thought about for a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it's so fascinating. You know, books have had such a big impact. And it's one of those things that even as technology grows, I truly believe that, that just the old, the real book, having that physical book is like the most important thing. You know, having that shelf, having that physical book. Of course, audio books are great to listen to mm -hmm. sometimes, but like, I don't, I'm not a Kindle fan. Sorry, Kindle user. Now I just, you're my favorite person in the world. Right. I love the physical book. I, I like reading it. I like marking it up. I like beating it up. I like looking at it and be like, wow, this has been a journey of this thing. You know, you take them all over the world. You know, it's, you, you're probably the same. What do you think about that? I am the same. And it doesn't mean, I mean, look, there is a large contingent of people who for one reason or another prefer eBooks. It's the weight, it's the portability, whatever. Yeah. There's a large contingent of people who prefer audio books because they, that's the sense through which, you know, reading is hard for some people. I happen to love reading and I lose my focus almost immediately when I'm listening to an audiobook. That's just me. When I hear people say no one reads anymore, I'm like, I, we have to, I don't know what to do. <laughs> wow. That's the thing. But I feel like, <laughs> I feel like there's been a real boom in reading again. And just well, like I think there is too. people, people realizing, especially in the entrepreneurial world, because mm -hmm. everybody is realizing that mm -hmm. it's not about just making the money because if you aren't filling your cup, you are, you are not going to be able to fill someone else's. So you need to, there's millions and millions of dollars worth of value in books that you could take in, you know? And oh, that, that's the thing right there is that it's, your problem, and, and you've raised a great point, which is that most people will not make money from the book. They will make money off the back end of the book, whether it's coaching, courses, speaking, um, online programs, you know, whatever the case may be, unless you're writing purely fiction and you're just book after book after book after book and you've got your, your followers, that's a completely different thing. But you said something before that I thought was really interesting about, um, it, it's like there's kind of a dichotomy because so many entrepreneurs write a book, or what, sorry, so many entrepreneurs want to write a book, and then at the same time, like they're not doing it. And so I get why they're not doing it. I get the fear part. The reason they want to do it is because as human beings, we want our story to matter. Period. Yeah you know, and we want to be able to tell our story in our words, with our language, without someone else saying that didn't never happen. Yeah. And usually we want the struggle to stand for something. Do you find that it's the people that actually read books that see the value in writing a book? That's a great, great point. Um, so Okay, I have a philosophy that a book under about 40,000 words is really not a book. Now, we could, we could debate this a little bit. It's not a hard and fast rule, but that's kind of my buffer. And I remember, you know, some of my clients don't want to read War and Peace. When they go buy a business book, they want it to be 
150 pages, get to the point, give me the, let, let's go. And I'm all about bringing in story. So what's interesting is that many times, if not most times, people want to read the same, people want to write the same type of book that they prefer to read, which is right. fair. I mean, that makes sense because there are undoubtedly thousands, if not more people who would be interested in the exact same thing. Right. And that, that's a very interesting point. But the, f the thing is, is like, I remember when I got into reading, I started, I was reading a bunch of biographies about mm -hmm. people, yeah. but it wasn't making me feel very good. So I was reading stuff like um, Red Hot Chili Peppers and all this stuff, but then it was always like this bad feeling. And then I was like, wait a minute, why don't I start reading things that are going to lift me up? So I remember I started reading The Power of Now and spiritual books because you're putting all this mental energy into it. Why would you yeah. read, why would you read something that is going to make you feel like shit? You know, that's just me. I started to ask myself, like, what am I doing here? And I can't speak for anybody else. So I was like, I want to feel good after. It's the same reason why I don't like to watch movies that make me feel like that, right? Because you're programmed. Which is also the same reason why some people do like to read books that make them feel like shit, because yeah. they're looking for a validation yeah. of what there are. You know, it's just, it's where are you and where are you trying to go? Yeah. So I have a, a print in my office that says, you can't save the damsel who loves her distress. Right. If someone is like quite literally addicted to drama and negativity, they're going to seek that out because it's, it's the enablement of it. If you're looking to come out of that, you're going to do the opposite. Yeah. And so with books, like, I mean, <clears throat> what is, what is your, what, what is your, I know you probably get asked this all the time, but like, what is your top three or what is a book that really stood out to you and that oh. you, oh, and another question and the loaded question here. As okay. far as, because I don't want to forget this, so I want to say okay. it. So you have your top books, but then do you value just taking a couple really good books and just reading them over and over again? Mm -hmm. Or do you find value in having like a bunch of them and reading them all, that kind of thing? Okay, so both. So as far as my fate, so should I say what my favorite books are? Sure, I would love to. I know that's a hard question because- No, it's not. I know exactly okay. what they are. Perfect. I mean, granted, there have been some ones that I've read recently that I, you know, I could have a list of like my top 20, but if you said, what are your top three, unequivocally, it's The Alchemist, Anna Karenina, and Alice in Wonderland, which I, I just realized all begin with A. I didn't even awesome. realize that before now. Now, your second question, the answer is yes and yes to question two and three. So I have probably 60 books sitting here waiting to be read. and so. The likelihood that I'm, I mean, I'm hoping to just get through them, but the likelihood that I'm going to read each of them again is low, but there are ones that I absolutely will read again. So I have one, I'm, I'm looking over on my bookshelf because I'm trying to get the name, but it's by Penny Pierce and it's called, um, oh, come on, Liz. It's about um, intuition. Okay and relationships between people and the spiritual connection between the book is destroyed like literally destroyed because i've opened it and i've dog-eared it and i've highlighted i go back to it often and i will probably read it several more times i've already started rereading it for the second time i've read anna karenina several times and the alchemist several times a late the latest one i got that i will read again and again is called the mosaic uh, by daniel bruce levin and danny i had him on my podcast he's it's incredible. His, the book has been likened to The Alchemist, which he keeps hearing afterward, but he had never read The Alchemist. So I wasn't surprised that I liked it. But when I first heard that it was like The Alchemist, I thought, well, I wonder if I'm going to like it because I wonder if I'm going to feel like it's too much. It's, it's its own thing. I'm telling you, it's its own thing. It's all about connection and it'll make you think for days. So there are some books that I, I was just talking to someone earlier today about the concept of speed reading. And he said, have you ever thought about taking a course in speed reading so you can just get through these things faster? And I said, well, I, I, it's passed through my mind for a hot second, but I've never given it any consideration because for me, I think speed reading is about reading real fast just to get the points. I love the act of immersing myself in the words of a book. So I read intentionally that's the only way I know how to say it. And I'm, I'm underlining and I'm dog earing and I'm 
exclaiming when I read quotes that are just like, because when someone can say, I'm reading Anne Lamott right now, when Anne Lamott, who does this brilliantly, can say in a paragraph exactly what you've been thinking but weren't able to put into words, it's like a hallelujah moment. Like, I don't even. Yeah, it's, it's amazing having that. And I, I like what you said about really like immersing yourself in the book because I have to do that. Otherwise, I won't remember yeah. it. Right. And yeah. I, I love Alchemist because it's such an awesome story. I listened to that on audio, which is awesome. And I'm also, really? I'm re- yeah, I, I'm, I'm reading um, the Celestine Prophecy right now. Okay. Another story sort of thing. I love those, Correct. like they're stories, right? They're like it's, fables. Yeah. They're it's, like it's the like, solid gold in there. Yeah. You know, and there's so many messages. Yeah. You don't have to have a 400 page book for it to be impactful, but I just don't want people to to use that as a, it's like, those are the outliers when you can write a short book and have it be that impactful. That's not the most common yeah. uh, result. But it's like watching, I mean, how many, are there movies that you watch again and again? Yeah, there's- And there's you get, you see something new every time, you get a joke differently or- it's, it's crazy how like certain movies will come on TV. You know which one that just came to my mind was Forrest Gump. Yeah. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Yeah. If it's on, I'm like, oh man, this is good. I got to quit. There's so many things happening, like the music, the feel. Mm-hmm. It was just brilliantly done. Like timeless, you know? Timeless. That was the one. I'm going to I- embarrass myself by saying the one that keeps coming on my TV that I stop and have to, is Wedding Crashers. I, I cannot watch that movie too many times. Yeah. I'm not learning anything. I'm not impacted to be clear, except like my abdominals get a workout. I'm impacted in that way. But I see something different or I hear something different. And it's the same with going back to those books. I mean, when you have a book like, uh, I'm still trying to remember Penny Pierce, just everyone remember Penny Pierce. But um, when you have a book like that, that has so much gold in it, it's almost impossible to get it all out the first time and retain it. And my big thing is I like books that are implementable and the majority of my clients are writing books that are implementable. So it's not just go out and do this and do this and do this. It's how, how do you do that? And to really implement, you've got to really dig in and do the exercises and write the answers and think about things and go back to your childhood and all these things that are sometimes not super fun. That's why I like Tim Ferriss books because they're so relatable. Mm-hmm. Like Tools of the Titans was a life-changing book for me. You know, he's got all these high performers and he breaks down yeah. their habits, what they do. Yeah. And it's like, you can go ahead and apply that. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Like, that's, it, that's what it is. It feels good because you're like, wow, I can, I can read I can right now. I would take that. I just think I was in Australia and I, would, I was at the beach and that was the perfect beach book because I would li- yeah. li- use it as a pillow. And then I would read a lesson or two <laughs> and I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to get too. sometimes see my attention span. I don't know if other people can re- relate, but my attention span is very low at times. So sometimes I just want something real digestible. Mm-hmm. I can read it and then I can go, Hmm, okay. And then that's it. And I don't have to get you know, caught up in the whole story because if you, sometimes you don't finish the whole chapter, you kind of forget. Oh, right. Just, Correct. Right? So sometimes those kind of books are good. And yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that one stood out. Um, I just have a couple more questions for you. Like okay. just real basic stuff before, uh, before I ask you, you know, where we can find you. What is, you may get asked this, but you know, how do you prime your day? You know, how do you, how do you, uh, oh, I love that question. How do you, I'm not going to say morning routine, but you right. know, how, do you, <laughs> how, how do you, how do you get primed? Like, how do you get jacked yeah. up? How do you be, what do you like become to have a good day? What needs to happen? So this, this has been a thing for me over the last couple of years is figuring this out because, and I, in fact, I write in enough, like three years ago, my morning routine was wake up exhausted, listen to the kids fight, get them to school, call my best friend and chat for an hour to procrastinate, you know, turn on Netflix. I mean, I had a routine down, but it was not a productive one. It was not moving the needle for me. So then I went completely to the other side, right? And I started to follow what a lot of um, successful entrepreneurs whom I respect were doing with the reading and the meditating and 
the HIT workout and, you know, climbing a mountain and all this. And I was like, I'm not going to make it. Like by 9 a.m., I have to be back in bed. And it took me a minute because at first I saw myself as such a kind of a failure because I, I was having a trouble adopting that routine. And, and I tried to talk my way out of it every which way from Sunday, like, well, it's just new and you'll this. I have found something in moderation. So again, there are several kids in this house, so I have to get them up and out and whatever they're doing. But I read every single morning without fail. I meditate every single morning without fail. And I figure out what the top thing is for me to get done that day. So those three things are non-negotiable. Now, there are other days when I might add in some sort of exercise or yoga or you know, reconnecting with someone or who knows what. But those are my three. Once I've done that, off we go. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, meditation is so important. And I've really noticed it, that it's, it's just a sense of just, I, don't, I can't explain it, but just like you can't explain gravity, right? Right. Works, right? The computer you turn on works. How can right. you explain a cell phone, how it works? No. no right? right. It's, it's like you just got to – and it's, it's truly an amazing thing. And I recommend yeah. anybody, if you haven't done it yet, at least try and sit in stillness. And, yeah, no, I love that. It's, it's so important. And to feed your mind in the morning. That's one thing I should probably start doing. I don't read enough. You know, it's, it's one you of those could read things. enough. It's the title of my book. So you could literally read enough if you wanted to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. That was good. That I was love good. it. That was good. So but the thing about meditating, if I can just say this really yeah, fast, of course. It, you know, a couple of years ago when people said meditate, I was like, I hate you. Don't talk to me about meditating. I don't meditate. I'm never going to meditate. I can't shut my mind down for even a 10th of a second. So a lot of it is just not putting the pressure on yourself to think that meditation has to be a certain thing, to think that you have to be able to shut your mind. I still cannot, well, I shouldn't say can't because I don't like the word. I am not good at doing it for more than about 15 minutes, but I'm religiously doing it for between seven and 15 minutes. See, that's the thing. It's the consistency. It doesn't matter because if you, if you yeah. do it for 45 minutes one day, but don't do it the next, it doesn't. That's, that's it. Right. But like, yeah. it's, it's because people are so used to the instant gratification. Like they need right. to have some sort of reward for doing it. And it doesn't show up like that. It shows up in other ways. It shows up when somebody pisses you off at the grocery store, you're able to stay calm. Somebody says something on social media and you learn to re not react. Correct. You know, those, those things aren't always, you don't get tangible things, but there's so many things that it helps you in. Yeah, and for sure. And it's that like that urge to fight it. And sometimes if you just sit and not expect like, oh, I'm going to fall into this mystical world. That's not what happens. Right? <laughs> no, like, it's just gonna not be, to me anyway. You I just mean, need to observe your thoughts. You just need to say, hmm, yeah. hello thought. Why are you here? What's your purpose? Okay, I don't, I don't need yeah. you. Goodbye. Like it's, well, and to your point earlier about, you know, being so happy with your external world, but not so much with your internal world. For me, that's what the meditation is, is remembering why I do what I do. Exactly. It's, it's not about the things that we often think it should be about or is about, or it's not, it's, re, it's just reminding myself what's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And our minds are real. Once we realize that our minds are crazy. They are oh, like everybody's. Insane. It's it's yeah. like it's, yeah. it's kind of funny. You sit back and you it is kind of funny. Realize, you're like, wow, I'm I'm a bit crazy, but so is he. So is she. Like everybody. Is right. When I heard that Tony Robbins had a breathing coach, I was like, this is the greatest news ever. Yeah, um, I'm so because excited. We think that that's I, not you know. Come on. Yeah, I know for sure, for sure, for sure. I'm actually going to Tony Robbins next month. Oh, you are. Yeah. What are you going to? Is it David? Yeah, unleash your power within. Oh, unleash your power. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, or power he's, within. Yeah. Tony Robbins is my guy. You know, he's he's my uh, he's that one that was like, man, I, I love this guy. Mm -hmm. You know, no, I mean, he doesn't really. Not everybody can resonate with him, but it's, no. for me, it's. I I find him. I I just love the guy. He just he sh literally shifts my state by watching him. Yeah, you're you're. 
you've brought up a critical point, which is that even somebody like Tony Robbins isn't for everyone. So that's why it's so important when you're telling your story, um, when you're living your story, forget telling it, just like when you're living it, to not be so focused on what everyone else expects of you and what everyone else thinks that you should be doing. If you just speak to one person from a genuine place within you, there are going to be quite more than one who is, are, is, are, no, no, gonna respond to that. And that's what he's create. That's what he's proven. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times we're trying to speak to too many people and worrying about trying to satisfy all these people, yep. especially on like, I used to have a lot of troubles doing lives on Facebook because I'm like, if I talk about this, will this guy think of this or all yeah. this? And I started, I started to think like, I don't give a shit anymore. What anybody thinks, if you want to listen, listen, right. if not, I don't care if yeah. you're saying anything. Like, but if, you're, if you're going to say something negative, my question is, why are you here? You're here. Yeah. Like, you can unfriend me. Yeah. But you're not. So <laughs> exactly. I don't understand. Like, no one's forcing you to watch this. So absolutely, I think getting to that place where you're just comfortable and confident enough in any given moment to say, here I am, and here's what I'm thinking, and here we go, right? Here's what I have to give today now give back it's it's all just an exchange yeah totally and without that expectation because you want to know like oh i have all these people yeah. commenting or jumping on it's like it's so stupid if you forget that then it just becomes right. what it should be is but, you just being your authentic self that's it right yeah and people know when you're not yeah i mean yeah, it's it's easy to see. It's easy. But this yeah. is this is a journey that so many people have to go through and it takes more time for others to go through. And I think every entrepreneur has to go every single one. I don't care where you start. I don't care if you start like you come to this country, you don't even speak the language, you're living in a hostel versus you come from an extreme amount of wealth and you're living in your New York City penthouse and starting a business regardless you at some point you have to do that mindset work and that internal work to, to make sure that you get yourself on you know clicked onto the right path and that you stay there absolutely i just think it's non-negotiable there's so much amazing stuff in this conversation and i just want to ask you one more thing before we um before we send off here what is the one thing that you can suggest to overcome adversity so a lot of different adversities come in different ways in people's lives. But from your expertise and what you've gone through, what is the one thing that you can give somebody that they can apply to go on to achieve amazing results in their life? So this might sound, it, this has been said many different ways. Let's put it that way. It's, it's, but I personally have benefited a tremendous amount from asking myself, in almost any circumstance, where's the opportunity in this? Because the one thing that no one can ever take away from you is your decision on how you react or respond or see something. Um, and so being able to look at things from that perspective, when you're trying to build a business, when you run into an issue with your business, when you run into an issue with the male person, whatever it is, it's like, what's the opportunity here? And, and where, do I where do I have an opportunity to learn and where is there an opportunity for me to impact somebody else in a positive way? Awesome. I just don't think that ever goes wrong. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Where, um, where can we find you? Let's get you plugged. Plugged. All um, the fun the best, stuff. Right, right. The best place is probably just my website, elizabethlyons.com, which I snagged before the now infamous country singer, elizabethlyons.com. Country music is the one genre I do not listen to. And I love being tagged all over social media with people thinking that I am cheap. That is epic. So, isn't that epic? I know, <laughs> marvelous. They're like, Elizabeth Lyons rocked it out last night. And I've always wanted to be a rock star. So I'm like, I did, didn't I? And then I think, oh, that's the other Elizabeth Lyons. Shoot. But on my Facebook, uh, I'm, you know, Facebook is the platform on which I'm most active. Instagram is the second most active. And those are all on my website, my contact info, et cetera. Awesome. I just want to say thank you so much because this, you. this is so much fun. And I'm looking at the time. I'm like, man, like I could just keep I talking, know. but it's like, <laughs> I just love these so much that you get, you know, we could just talk and just, you know, 
um, just share what you have because you have like an amazing gift. And I just Thank look you. forward to, um, it's just so easy to talk to you. And I can just imagine like you connecting with entrepreneurs and just being able to really extract all of the gold that they want to give. And um, I'm just so excited to continue to watch your journey and see where it all goes likewise, likewise. and to continue and to work with you as well. Like this is amazing. So um, likewise, I'm so glad we connected. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody. So much, everybody check out Elizabeth Lyons with all of the stuff's going to be in the show notes, but it's going to be her social media, Elizabeth Lyons and Elizabeth right? You got it. Perfect. All yeah. right. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.